Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, unfortunately, there's still, well, about a month or so still till racing action gets back underway. But never fear, we are here uh, to chat all things MotoGP regardless. And well, in the last week, Peko Bagnaia's car crash was the main headline after failing a breathalyzer test too. It seems though he's fine, has issued an apology and has carried on with his PR activities can't wait to get Keith's opinion on that one. Plus, though, we've got all of your questions still to answer and get through. And we'll be taking a look back at how the rookies in the field have been performing in this first half of the season. The recording date is Monday, the 11th of July. My name is Harry Benjamin. Joining me as ever is Crash's MotoGP editor, Pete McLaren, and former Grand Prix rider and British champion, Keith Hewin. And, well, let's get into the biggest headline from the last week, Keith. It was, of course, Peko Bagnaia, who were... Uh, out celebrating uh, his win uh, from Assen and and then, well, driving home on his own in a car and ended up, I think, two wheels in a ditch and uh, then over the limit, uh, of the Spanish limit at least, by quite some margin when he was then breathalyzed. He has issued an apology, but just carried on as normal since then. Yeah, only one word comes to mind really, doesn't it? Idiot. You know, and he'll be feeling like an idiot. Um, I mean, I can make comparisons back in the day, as I do often. Um, but right now, as where we are in life, in the world, with our knowledge, and with the opportunities to be able to do things completely differently to how it was back in the day, um, he should never have been in that position. He should never have put himself in that position. All youngsters have done it at some stage or another, sadly, I, I believe, because certainly... Most of my mates, and I'm ashamed to say so have I, have been caught drinking and driving, but never actually been done for it because back in the day, you know, you got a slap on the wrist, um, leave your car where you are and walk home sunny um, was the attitude back then. And even at, at racetracks, I mean, there have been people that have tested positive for drugs, that have tested positive for, for booze, you know, back in the day. It was sort of how it is. But that's all been sort of worked out of the system. Personally, and this is going to come as a shock to you two, I know it is, I am actually in favour of a zero tolerance policy for drinking and driving. I believe that, that any system that says that you can have one means that as soon as you've had one, you think, oh, I'm OK, I'll have another. But if it's a zero tolerance situation, like in the Czech Republic, for instance, or somewhere like that, when we're travelling nowadays, when I go to Grand Prix nowadays, there are certain countries that have zero allowance. You've got you know, alcohol on your breath and you're done. That's it. So I quite like that because it leaves you in a position where there is no doubt. There's no there's no room for error. There's no room for thinking you're OK because you ain't as soon as you've had something past your lips. So we kind of live in that that situation where uh, there is a possibility you're going to get away with it. And as soon as that's around, you know, youngsters being youngsters push their luck. He's been on Ibiza. He's been celebrating, you know. Da -da. I'm not, uh, by the way, forgiving this by 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 being sounding fairly lenient because I think that there is no real excuse for it, especially with the kind of money he's got and the kind of backup he's got. You know, why do you need to be in a hire car on your own trying to get home when you're basically pissed? It's just daft, really. But then you can see the other side, being a youngster, being as confident he is in his own ability to do everything that he can in a car, on a bike. And believe me, when you're at his level, he believes he can walk on water with a vehicle and then he goes and cocks it up in the manner that he has done. And, and, and basically to wrap that up, yes, he should get a massive rap on his knuckles as far as the legality of it's concerned. I don't believe that it will ever, ever happen again. It shouldn't have happened this time. I'm not making an excuse for it because at the end of the day, I think we've got to try and work that out where there is no excuse. You just don't drink. But the point being is, is that current legislation, he's gone over the top. He's made a massive mistake. Give him what he's due as far as the, the legality of his concern. Should it affect his sporting life? No, not in my view. I don't think so. Um, there'll be a lot of people that disagree with me on that one. Um, but I don't think that that would be any benefit whatsoever to anyone, anywhere, at any time. The team's going to take a fair, fairly sizable hit on this as well. Um, because PR-wise, you mentioned it, there's going to be a fair bit of pushback on a drink-driving um youngster that's that's promoting your product um so you've got a you've, you've definitely got a problem there but i think that professionally you shouldn't be punished 
personally, he should be punished and will be. You can be sure of that. Yeah, well, Pete, what, what's the fallout then on, on the sporting side of it? Ducati uh, have obviously had to acknowledge this as well. Uh, you know, they're, they're star rider, really, uh, making waves and, and not in the right way in the off-season where there's not much else going on. So the spotlight is even greater. Yeah, I mean, Ducati at the moment, I mean, like everyone I've asked, I mean, they're, they're not commenting. And I think you can understand that. I think they're going to wait for, let's say, the legal process to to come out it looks like you know we're hearing possibly one to four years of a, of a driving ban is what you, you're looking for here but until he's actually gone through that process been found guilty you don't know we do hear about things in the uk sometimes where people get off on a technicality so i think you can understand you are just waiting and seeing here what what goes on here what actually comes out at the end of this but um you know banyai has admitted he was found to be over the limit wasn't he there was that statement that that keith referred to and uh yeah, there, I mean, there was a bit of legal wording, I thought, in that, where it looked like someone had looked over it because it was just, there were, were sort of, you know, he he came out of the disco, which sort of amused me that a youngster in their mid-20s would say disco, but um, <laughs> and, and then found himself facing the roundabout with, with the front wheels in a ditch. And, 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 you know, that was it. There was no mention of driving, of a car, of, of anything else. And, but I think that's, you know, they're being careful here not to preempt the official... I mean, we spoke, didn't we, Quattro, a completely different situation, but Quattro comes out, gets off the bike and says, I've, I've made a stupid mistake in Assen before the FIM stewards have, have reached their verdict. And you do wonder if, you know, does that, when you admit doing something stupidly in that way, that it might sort of influence the final decision. So I think carefully worded apology, if you like. Don't think that was Pecco. Um, a carefully worded <laughs> apology. And um, I think that, the, I agree with Keith, I don't think it should affect his that sporting was Fabio. career <laughs> yeah that's Fabio after it <laughs> I think it wasn't at a MotoGP event it wasn't at a Ducati event I do wonder though where were his friends you know as Keith says you know you, you shouldn't be going out with your keys if you're going out in the knowledge you're going to be drinking but where were his friends where were you know we know was there anyone from the team there anyone from VR46 there of course this was a party for friends but I mean work and friendship is very closely linked in the MotoGP paddock. And I think if you're Valentino Rossi, you might have wondered, how did this happen? Why did nobody sort of spot this? But then we all know people who, they, you know, they have a few drinks and they just disappear, don't they? I mean, they might not have known. There's a lot that we don't know about this. We don't know how far he'd been driving for before he had this accident. Um, fortunately, nobody was hurt. He has that hashtag, doesn't he? Go free. Maybe part of this punishment will be go alcohol free and he'll become, <laughs> the, you know, the, the fastest moving alcohol awareness campaign for the rest of the season or something like that. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, joking aside, importantly, nobody was hurt. And I think as Keith says, this, this will be put down as one big, silly one-off mistake. And if it stays like that, I think he'll he'll get through it. And it's just another example of his year of highs and then lows. You know, the winner, Assen, and now, at, with, combined with Quattararo's first real mistake, gives him that little chance, doesn't it? Still a big points lead to bridge, but and then suddenly now he's going to have this, not directly affecting him, but it's going to be on his mind, isn't it? You know, it's going to be playing there. So, yeah, it's just another example. What a year for him. And we're only in July. <laughs> oh, there, that's the, that's the thing, isn't it? It, it, I was reading on the the main article that you can go and read on on crash.net about all the specifics of you know what's allowed in Spain what's allowed in the UK and also what is allowed in the MotoGP paddock across the weekend and it, and it seems like they're just not not allowed to to drink at all during a weekend which I I imagine would make sense but Keith not even you know a little small bottle of something on a on a Saturday night not allowed in MotoGP across the weekend well, you know, at the end of the day, I think Pete makes a good point. Um, this could be turned into a really good campaign amongst youngsters to not drink. I mean, the fact of the matter is, I think you can turn this as a positive rather than look at all the negatives that are involved in it. And I think that would be the way that corporately I would want to go. If I was if I was Ducati, I'd be looking towards the positives. How can we turn this? How can we spin this to be something good? And the fact is, your top line runner has made a mistake. And I mean, there are going to be more people that listen and look at his example than there would be by some, you know, legislation that gives him a, a massive slap and takes away his drug, racing license for a for a, a meeting or whatever else they might do. I, I think it can be turned into a positive. I mean, certainly, you know, from my own experience, I mean, I remember, you know, we all used to be out on the lash, 
you know, Friday night, no problem at all. I mean, the amount of stories I've got in my head of famous riders being face down on a Friday night and then qualifying on a Saturday and racing on a Sunday. But that was then, this is now, we leave, we live in a completely different world to the one we used to do. And we're more aware of the of the effects these things can have. And the, and the, and the, you know, okay, so he ended up in a ditch, two wheels in a ditch, nobody got harmed, nothing got wrecked, he didn't get hurt, neither did anybody else. But how easily can that be converted into a family being wiped out? You know, drunk driving, drink driving is, is not okay. In fact, out of all the things that seem to be politically correct nowadays, of all the things that are not okay in this modern world, and a lot of them I don't like, this is the one where I think is right to be draconian over because it causes so much grief to so many people unnecessarily. You know, going out and getting pissed is great, great fun if that's what you want to be doing. But if you've got sort of two ton of metal around you and uh, you're, you're overcook it somewhere, the damage you can do with that is just so huge. Um, and we, we live in the corporate world we're living in at the moment. I have some experience of this, not when it comes to drinking late on, because, you know, nowadays it's a, it's a completely different kettle of fish to, to when I was young. But um, I did a stage show for Silverstone. And what I'm about to talk about is association with somebody that's that's involved in something that corporately isn't correct anymore. Um, I did a stage show for Silverstone. Silverstone branding, Silverstone event at the British Grand Prix. Uh, one lady in the crowd really took exception to the language that was being used on the stage. Not mine as far as I can recall. I think it was more that there were one or two riders that chucked a couple of Fs into the into the into the scenario, which was hugely funny. And bearing in mind we got, you know, five or six thousand people stood in front of us that are mostly bikers and all having a right old laugh. It really was quite good fun. But this one lady had got her children with her and took exception to it, complained to BT, complained to Silverstone, massive inquiry. BT went way over the top with the whole thing, tried to get footage of it, tried to find this. And even though I wasn't branded with BT, I'm associated with BT at that particular point, and they took a major exception to that. And you can kind of understand it. These corporates nowadays are trying to be so squeaky, politically correct, clean, that they will take, uh, you know, some kind of action in some kind of circumstances they will look at how um, they can handle that in a different way and maybe bang Naya, by virtue of the fact the italians have got a slightly different attitude the ducati have got a slightly different attitude to these kind of things as well you know he may well i hope get away with it regarding the the professional and sporting side but the other side of things as i've said he's going he's going to get done for it fair dues, he's going to cop whatever he cops and he's going to have to hold his hands up and uh, take his punishment. And hopefully, as I've also said, based on what Pete mentioned a minute ago, was uh, to to turn it into a positive, turn turn what is a, a negative situation into a positive that's going to promote no drinking, no driving, and so on. Hey, you didn't think I'd Absolutely. fall on that side of you two, did you? You know, Coming out of the yeah, disco no. pissed. Now that's a bit of me, isn't it, really? The disco. I like the disco. The first time I ever said disco in our hire car, when I'd got Hodgson and, and the others in the car, they rolled around laughing at me. What do you mean it's not a disco? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You're right, though. It's an odd word to use, disco. You, I, I, the dis, maybe, or maybe it's a translation. Discotheque, maybe. It's a, mm-hmm. basically a club, isn't it? But, uh, well, we'll see how that one pans out for Peko Banyai. But uh, hopefully, as we have said, it will uh, be turned into a, a positive uh, moving forward. And he definitely won't do that again. Um, OK, well, let's uh, get on to uh, the main event, shall we, uh, in our show today. Uh, looking at the rookies, of course, um, and a couple lined up this year, all hugely talented, coming from uh, great backgrounds, working their way up through uh, the ranks. Marco Pizzecchi uh, in the uh, Mooney VR46, uh, Fabio De Giantantonio, Grissini, Darren Binder, uh, Remy Gardner and Raul Fernandez are our rookies uh, this year. Maybe if we start with um, the best placed of them all so far, Marco Pizzecchi, best result, of course, that podium at the Dutch TT, seven points finishes to his name. He is the leading rookie in the standings. Uh, and Keith, you know, what have you made of, of our rookies and and particularly, of course, uh, the best at the moment as we're at the halfway point, Pizzecchi? Well, to fill everybody in at home that's listening to this or watching it is, you know, Harry gives us a bit of a heads up in the morning of what he'd like to discuss. 
Um, and uh, he, he put the rookies in here. So I actually did a quick bit of research here to look at and to make a bit of comparison with last year. And I mean, if you look at, you know, the, the likes of Bastianini, where he was last year, Bastianini was, you know, well out of it points wise. He'd got something like 27 points at this particular point, whereas Bezecchi has got 55 points at this point in the season. So straight away, you're looking at a comparison. Even if you knocked off the 20 points that Bezecchi got at Assen last time out, he'd still be on 35 more than Bastianini. The reason I make that comparison is obviously Bastianini, one year on from being a rookie, is right in there with race wins. You know, it's a situation where never write off a rookie. It's it's you, you don't quite know. Sometimes it takes one, two years. I always it always galls me slightly when when riders don't get that second year, that third year. I, I keep harping back to Jake Dixon. I know quite a lot. It's not just because I like Jake, um, but the fact is is that you know if he hadn't been given that second year opportunity, we would have lost. A potential Grand Prix winner from the, from the Grand Prix, you know, it's a it's a situation where some riders, most riders, need two or three years. We're talking MotoGP at the pinnacle of bike racing, the pinnacle of technology, the pinnacle of getting used to these kind of things. It's quite tricky, and you're up against massive opposition. So I think that Bezeki is 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 shining brightly. Uh, Digi. I think Binder has been the other outstanding one. I've got to say, I, I think Darren Binder, for me, coming up from Moto3 straight in, has done a much better job than people are giving him credit for, which, uh, well, some people certainly are giving him credit, but I think he's been slightly overlooked. You know, Basher Binder, you know, Dive Bomb Binder, all the things that we used to call him in Moto3, you know, he's been doing a really solid job in MotoGP, coming straight up. And, I mean, bearing in mind he's, what, the third rookie in this. He's only eight points behind Digi. Um, he's ahead of Remy Gardner and Raul Fernandez, who, whether it's them or whether it's the team underperforming, I tend to look at something. When you've got two riders of that quality, a few points apart, I, I think the team must take as much responsibility for that as they do as rookies. Um, and again, when you've got two rookies in a, in a team, that's, that, that is a tricky old scenario as well. But I think based on looking at last year, I mean, Bezeki is looking like the outstanding man that he is. He's the, the you know, by far and away the, the, the highest point scoring rookie and looks to have a great future ahead of him. I'm just looking to see where Marini was and the like as well, because I made a note of that. You know, yeah, Bastianini was the was the man of last year, really, 2021. He was um, the guy to watch out for. And then Jorge Martin, of course. And Luca Marini, they were the top three in the rookies at this point last year. And look what they're doing now. They're right up there, really. It's, um, I think, an extra year. Don't write off the rookies, is the phrase. Um, I mean, that's an interesting stat straight away anyway. But, you know, about the Bastianini uh, figure, that surprised me. I've got to admit, I, I, like Keith, I looked up, obviously, the rookies. I didn't look back to last year. But I was also surprised just this year. I didn't realise Bezeki had quite that big an advantage over the other over the other four. He's really, you know, he has come on strongly. Obviously, big points all in Assen. But still, um, uh, Keith summed up Bezeki perfectly, I think, with everything he said there. The only, the only thing you might say looking ahead is, there's a queue of Ducati riders, isn't there? Young Ducati riders. And does he feel that maybe he's at the wrong end of that queue? And and maybe, you know, there's a Prilia now, another Italian manufacturer that I'm sure would love an up and coming Italian star. You know, you know if you're Bezecchia, you may be thinking, well, look, there's a lot of, you know, there's Bagnaia, there's Martin, there's Bastianini ahead of me in this queue at Ducati. And yet, you know, if a Prilia were to come knocking and make an offer, would you consider that? I don't know. I mean, it sounds like um, Bezeki will stay where he is for next year. But certainly, if you're looking beyond that, if you're looking at, he's going to inevitably want to be at a factory team. And if he carries on this growth rate, I mean, sooner rather than later, it's uh, you know the seats at Ducati look like they're going to be full. So that, that's an interesting one. I think um, looking at Digia um, at Grassini, uh, okay, he's a long way back he, from Bezeki, but I think quite interesting. He scored. Uh, I think four four times in the last five races, all of his points have come recently. So he really has sort of made a step um, just in the past few races. It took him quite a long time to score points. And then he's really sort of hit his stride and built his confidence. And I think he's been saying that, that he feels he's he's sort of one step away from being really at the sharp end and perhaps at Bezeki's level. So if he can find that, I think he's, I think that's a, quite a surprise as well, because in, in Moto2, Bezeki was, I think you put Bezeki clearly above 
uh, did you in terms of his results, although his last year in Moto2 wasn't quite as good. Uh, Darren Binder, I agree with Keith. I mean, he's what, what can you expect from someone who's he's jumped straight from Moto3? And I think he's he's done better than people expected. I think he's he himself is saying he thinks he's surprised some guys in the team. And I think that's fair enough. But unfortunately, will he, will he have a ride next year? You know, with two people are being dropped from the grid by definition of Suzuki leaving. Um, at least two people, and that's without other guys moving in for Moto2, Agura, perhaps, people like that. You know, it's not looking good for Darren, and it's it's such a shame, isn't it? Because if you would look on paper, and, and you see there's two rookies, you know, below him in the standings, again, different bikes, of course, but still, you think, well, you know, he's, he's jumped straight from Moto3. You can imagine it will take him a bit longer, and he's already, he scored 10 points. Okay, only two races he's been in the points, but one in the wet, one in the dry, decent finishes. Um, he's done about as well as people could expect. So, and yeah, the, the last two guys, Gardner and Fernandez, you know, is it the KTM? As you say, you know, it's a difficult bike, we know, but but certainly, I mean, Gardner scored points in the first round. It looked good initially, and then it, momentum has all sort of swung to the other guys, the, particularly the Ducati guys. So, yeah, again, their futures are still to be confirmed. Um, you know, will Fernandez be at RNF? Will Gardner be kept on? We don't know, but. Um, yeah, there's definitely looking at it. There's a big spread of points. You know, five points for Fernandez. Okay, he's missed, missed a race or two, didn't he, with that with that injury after Portimao or at Portimao. Five points to fifty-five for Bezeki. Big spread of points. I think the one thing there, Pete, as well, is that there is a, a comparator, isn't there, in Jack Miller from Moto Three up into Moto GP. I mean, I think Jack found it quite tricky to start with. Um, you know, he hadn't his fitness level wasn't quite where he needed it to be, and I think Darren will have found the same thing. I think the big thing, it's not the psychological side of it, riding a motorbike is uh, enjoyable for any of these guys, but to, to the level of fitness that you need to run a MotoGP bike is really, really tricky, especially when you make that jump from a small bike, a Moto3 bike, without going through Moto2 um, straight to MotoGP. It's a big deal to get yourself in that level of fitness. And as we all know, <laughs> it's all very well going down the gym, but it takes months of getting yourself toned to the the level you need to race a motorbike of that of that type and even race fitness wise test fitness wise it's going to take him longer binder and he'll know what to do over the winter to be really really good for 2023 well, it's uh, certainly going to be a little bit of crunch time for, for Darren Binder. Speaking out this week, actually, uh, Remy Gardner was uh, was doing uh, some of the, the media rounds and, and he brought up a, a very interesting point about, I mean, MotoGP riders in general, but particularly the rookies, you know, are they protected enough when they come into MotoGP? You know, all, all riders get bruised and battered and certainly by the end of their careers, you know, they are certainly bruised and battered and, and have to live with, you know, look at Mark Marquez, you know, having to live with many uh, injuries and, and hospital visits and surgeries and things like that. Uh, and and Remy Gardner, you know, again, one of the, uh, the well, Tech 3 with first and second from Moto2 last year. You think, you know, that's going to be a stellar lineup. It hasn't come across, but we know the Tech 3 team is difficulty and perhaps they're facing an uncertain future, both of them too. But do you think, Keith, that the, the rookies in particular are protected enough? Gardner was bringing up ideas of, you know, a minimum wage for, for MotoGP and perhaps whether, you know, they're not going to be guaranteed seats, uh, especially if they're in a, a struggling team, they might be cast aside and then that all that hard work and pain to get there just one year and you're done, you know. Uh, it, it, does there need to be, to be some sort of commission made up for the riders to protect themselves? How do you view it? Not like that, it has mm -hmm. to be said. Um, okay. it's a tough life. There's no doubt about that. It's a situation where I generally fall on the side of a riders, but as soon as you start getting to rider unions or something along those lines, I just see that as a real negative impact. The thing is we've got lots of really, really good riders coming up through the ranks. And if there is somebody that's not for whatever reason, and it might be reasons that we don't know about behind the scenes, it might be that a rider isn't getting on with his team that causes trouble behind the scenes, who is psychologically not quite where the team want him to be. There are going to be a, a million reasons for, other than being on the racetrack and how fast you're going, behind the scenes that teams make decisions over. You know, other teams looking in, you know, think that they might be able to do better with a rider than perhaps the team that he's with already. So they poach you. You know, I think that, that any of this kind of legislation against... Um, riders getting hired and fired 
I'm not sure I'd agree with that at all. Um, I can see where Remy's coming from. Yeah, such a lot of effort. But hang on a minute. That's where we're at. He better have a word with his old dad if he wants to find out something about that. You know, being bruised and battered and um, becoming a world champion is written all over Wayne Gardner, his dad. Um, it's an intro Again, it's a modern take on things, isn't it, Harry? And being an old you know, an old git like I am now, it's kind of one of them things where I, these new ideas, these new new ways of thinking, of, of pastoral care, if you like, of, of riders that aren't quite hacking it, I take a harder view on than maybe the majority that are listening to this might do. They might think it's reasonable to, to have this kind of safety net for riders that haven't particularly hacked it in the first year. I don't think that's the case. From my perspective, I think management and team should always have the the autonomy to do what they want to do with them and to manage it in the way that they want to manage it. That might sound harsh towards riders, but only because there are other things going on behind the scenes that they see and they understand better than we do looking on from the outside. I think it's with the best of intentions, isn't it? I think, interesting, this sounds like it was brought up by Mark Marquez in one of the Riders Commi uh, Safety Commission meetings. Now, Mark doesn't need the money, I think it's <laughs> fair to say. So it's quite interesting, that he, but he did feel that for his fellow riders, he did understand that some of them were in this situation. And so he quite interesting that he was thinking in that way because he's not going to benefit from this. He's not, you know, he's not in a situation with his, you know, his achievements. He has no problem getting contracts. But yeah, he, it's uh, it's so difficult to try to make that happen, as Keith says. I mean, you know, how do you do that? I think the the one area that's maybe related to that that you can see, I think the riders might have a point, is that where contracts are not being honoured, I think that was something that, that was a concern, especially maybe in Moto Two, Moto Three, where where they 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 might kick out a rider without good reason during a season. I think then you can see what they mean. But trying to set wage levels and things like that. You know, because there's always going to be guys who will be willing to race in MotoGP, let's face it, for free to get a chance, you know, on the basis that if they can show well, what they but, can do, that they can earn that earn that money later in their careers. There's going to be guys that are going to be bringing money to teams. There's going to be you know, the majority in World Superbike, quite a lot in MotoGP, bring money to teams. It's, it's, the, old, it's the old car racing lot, isn't it, that, that started this off? It's the, the rich dad. Well, yeah, well, I didn't think it was uh, as much of a case in uh, two wheel world. I thought, well, in in cars, it's you know everyone's a pay driver, really. It just it just it depends on where your where your, where your money comes from. Is it your dad? Is it your is it your sponsor? Or is it a team? But I I didn't think it, that was actually so much the case in MotoGP. But obviously, it is. Uh, the other point I think that maybe Remy Gardner was trying to bring up was the fact that you know they, well, I think maybe we've already covered it. You know, having to to, to pay out and be able to afford to i suppose have surgeries and, and look after yourself if you're you know if you have a, a big incident uh, as a result of being in moto gp and if you are cast aside or if you're you know what if you know you're cast aside because of injury um and you can't afford to, to look after yourself well, and, and your contract's taken from underneath you you know that that brings up a whole wave of, of difficulty the the but the, the... But there are insurances for that, Harry. I mean, there are insurances. You take out massive insurances to, for if your career comes to an end prematurely, you will have insurance for that. I mean, it's, it's your responsibility or your team's responsibility to make sure that's in place. Um, I think that, you know, those basics, yes. I mean, surgery and so on and so forth should be covered by the sport, in my view, you know, you know but. You also have insurances. I mean, everybody has insurances, even in British superbikes. You know, a lot of the guys have, have got their own insurances as well as the basic insurances that are there um, to, to cover their you know, immediate costs after after surgeries and so on and so forth. So there, there are those things there already, um, maybe not to the level of a superstar, um, as in sort of Remy, if he, you know, he would... Problem you've got, I suppose, and I'm really in touch with this, is that when you race a motorbike, that's what you do. You race a motorbike. Your whole focus is on that. You're not looking at what you're going to do after racing. You're not looking at, you know, what am I going to do after racing? I got lucky. You know, there wasn't anybody in television at that time. So somehow I managed to sneak in and get that job. Um, and it was a, a lucky break for me 
But I came out of racing with zero money. I mean zero money. Um, it was a situation, I might have been, a, a you know, however many British champions and so on and so forth. But back in the day, there was no money. Um, and you don't think about it until the day it's over. And then you go, oh, shit, what am I going to do now? You know, there's, the, the one thing that racers do tend to have is they're quite swift on their feet and they are quite quick at picking up the pieces. They're quite resilient, quite resourceful people, generally. Um, and so, therefore, most of them manage to find something after after racing. I'm, I'm going to use a very good friend of mine, Roger Marshall, as an example. Roger Marshall, I think he was something like 15 times a British champion, an absolutely superb rider in this country, but ended up having to work for a living, really work for a living, just to make ends meet. And I mean, I really hope Roger doesn't mind me saying that because I have huge respect for Roger. He came out of being an absolute superstar to... To, to nothing like the kind of income that he needed to, to, to sustain himself for many more years. That's the other point, of course. You'll finish racing by the time you're, you're mid-30s at your latest, in most cases. Um, and so, therefore, there's a lot of life after that to fund, you know, generally with family, generally with kids, and so on and so forth. You know, anybody out there that's, that's scratching around trying to find a new job to, to earn an extra five grand a year or ten grand a year or whatever it might be, you imagine starting from scratch. You are a man with... No qualifications except you're a motorbike racer and quite good at PR. Um, that is not exactly top of most people's uh, shopping list when it comes to hiring people in. And and what's an average wage nowadays? I look at an average wage and think, how does anybody manage on an average wage? I can't. That's a fact. Um, you know, so there, I, I can see the reasoning behind it for Remy, although I can never see him quite being in that position. Um, there are certain things that I think that, and I'm going to have to research this now to find out whether the sport does pay for surgeries, does underwrite those immediate uh, medical costs and the like. And I don't know whether they do or not. And I feel like I should have known that, Harry. You've, you've caught me out there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but from the Sorry. ongoing I wasn't planning on asking that if question. If the career is brought to an end. <laughs> well, if, if the career has been brought to an end, then through accident, then you should have some insurance in place. There should be. Uh, insurance in place so I'm sure for that and I'm sure that most riders um, have that if teams don't have it overall but these are questions that uh, that probably are going to be carried forward to the next podcast when I've had a word with the powers that be yeah we'll uh, we'll get those answered don't you worry um excellent well I caught Keith out that's that box ticked excellent moving on um but it's clearly uh, a fascinating subject and interesting that Remy Gardner bring it up and off the back of as Pete was saying uh, Mark Marquez but if we bring it back to um to our rookies and and to round off our, our rookie chat well I mean Marco Bezzecchi looks like he's if we if we do a little rookie standings really and you know who's going to be the best of the rookies it's hard to look past at this point Marco Bezzecchi you know off the back of that fantastic podium uh in uh, at the Dutch GT you know can he now carry that momentum forward do you think that's unlocked something or was it making use of the, of the qualifying and the tricky qualifying that happened really I'll, I'll, is, is it unlikely we're going to see him up there consistently wow that's a question and a half, isn't it? Um, I think Bezeki's still got some headroom. I mean, he's he's got that sort of that slight genius that you see occasionally. Um, it does depend on now whether whether he can reach for the stars from from this particular point. But there's really no pressure on him except his own to to try and emulate what he's already done. I mean, it's a it's a fantastic result at Assen, and Assen is not an easy racetrack. At the end of the day, come rain, shine, or luck, you know, it's 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 not a track that um, you would say is uh, is easy in any circumstances. So I, I, it was a brilliant it was a brilliant result for him. There's no doubt about it. Let's see where he goes from here. That's all you can say with a rookie. You just don't know. You know who'd mm. have said Quattararo was going to be a, a, a MotoGP world champion after I call it one and a half wins in in Moto Two. One because he did get the win, and the other half because he got disqualified. But you know who'd have said he would he would be what he is now? I mean it's 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 a great thing about bike racing. You just don't know. You just don't know, do you? And, and and actually, one final thing, and Pete will come to you on this first. You know, it it, it might be that one of the Tech Three races, you know, our, our reigning Moto Two champ, Remy Garner, second Ralph Fernandez last year, both in that team, 
rumoured that one of them, at least, may well end up losing their seat. And and that, to me, is a big issue. Because how can one and two in Moto2 make the logical step up, in my view, to MotoGP, as I believe they've earned, then in a team where clearly, you know, the the, the bike is difficult. That, that was proven last year with Petrucci and Laquona too. And how, how can they that be justified? I know it's sport. I know it doesn't work like that. But, you know, what's next? Who goes? Where do they go? Is it the end of the ride for, for one of those riders? So just to be clear, the reason you're asking that question, Harry, is because we think Paul Espargaro, it sounds like, will be going to Tectoir, isn't it? So that's then going to mean that one of these guys, at least, is going to have to leave and make room for him. Paul is, of course, leaving because it sounds like Joan Mir will be at Repsol Honda. So it's that chain reaction that ends up with, with as you, you point out, Harry, one of the Tectoir guys, at least, having to, li- having to leave. Now, as you say, there, there are rumours about RNF and Fernandez because a year ago, if we were re- rewind a year ago, they were talking then, uh, you know, that Razan Mazzali, Yamaha and Fernandez were talking. Now, the trouble was that, that Fernandez was under contract with KTM. And so we had this bizarre situation about exactly a year ago where Fernandez was kind of saying, well, I'm happy to stay in Moto2, but it seemed like, you know, suddenly he gets announced in MotoGP. Um, I think it was during the, the Austrian Grand Prix weekend. So Lacona and Petrucci were on track, weren't they? And suddenly it flashed up that, that basically... They both lost their rides. They knew that at least one of them would go, but now they knew both of them would go. So, yeah, it, it was a difficult situation, wasn't it, for them in in that sense? So, what I mean by that is that it's not over for for these tech to, tech to guys. It looks like even if one of them will leave, they have a fighting chance of getting the RNF seat. Um, you, you know, Darren Binder, unfortunately, it looks less likely to have options at this stage. Um, but with the KTM guys, it's a bit tricky, and this includes Oliveira, because it seems like KTM do have these options. And so even though Oliveira, his place has been taken by Jack Miller, but he can't actually sign for someone, it seems, until the option is, you know, the timeline is, the clock has run down, let's say, and, and he's officially free to sign. And so I think it might be a while before, the, you know, where these guys are going to end up is completely clear. Um, Oliveira, there were talks about Grassini, weren't there? It ended up being Alex Marquez that went there. So now it sounds like it's, you know, he's closely linked with RNF. Um, you know, as far as is it, a, is it a bit cruel, the rookies, you know, having to do something, you, you know, being pushed out after a year? It is, but that's, it's always been like that, hasn't it? I don't think there's anything you can do about it. It's, it's, it's about, you know, if you're fast, teams will keep you on. And, and, you know, being fast is such a complicated thing. It relies on the bike, the team, your experience, a bit of luck sometimes, you know, and uh, yeah, the, they've had a tough time there's no there's no two ways about it you know it's a tough time for all the ktm riders i mean you know binder's done some some fantastic recoveries isn't he on race day but they're really struggling in qualifying with that bike and that puts them on the back foot for all of the races so you add in the fact that you're a rookie they're both rookies so they don't they can't just look at the other side of the garage and and there's this there's an experienced grand prix winner that they can sort of go with his setup so i think it's it's a difficult situation but i think you know they've got a fighting chance of getting that second year which is as keith says you, you sort of you sort of believe that all these rookies really they, they deserve a second year but it's a cruel sport and quite often it's you know last in first out well, it might well be the case there. I'm still not over Ika Laquona losing his seat, but uh, glad to see he's doing well in uh, in the world of uh, of super bikes. Uh, let's finish off though with uh, some listener questions. We had a couple uh, left over. Uh, actually, I say more than a couple. We won't answer them all now, but there's some some nice ones uh, coming up. Um, Tom Sellers has asked, uh, "Are you surprised Alex Marquez has got a ride for next year, Keith?" Oh, thanks. That's right under the bus there, Harry. Thank you. Um, Alex Marquez <laughs> hasn't really... Uh, he hasn't really... He hasn't really performed in the way that you might have expected him to. He's had flashes of it. You know, he's, a, he's, a, he's one of those characters that... He's a bit like Rins. I don't know it's the name Alex that does it. There's a lot of unforced errors in there. And I think that they haven't really been tidied up quite as much as they probably should have been. Um both have, have got great potential, but for some reason or another, there's there's this unforced error type situation that, that, that they both have been in. And it's been a career thing. It's not just been a, in, uh, in MotoGP. So I'm not surprised. No, obviously, because he is who he is and he rides a motorcycle really, really well. But as we've been discussing throughout this, he's a ruthless old, old place and uh, you could find yourself without a job. Um, 
for reasons less than 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 inconsistency like he has proved he has A strange career hasn't he alex marquez you know he came in with the repsol honda team straight to this great ride um obviously the place was vacated by lorenzo so it came up this opportunity then his brother you know expected to really have quite a quiet season wasn't he you know his brother mark on the other side would be taking all the limelight probably winning the world championship instead mark goes and breaks his arm at the first race and suddenly you know everything changes doesn't it alex is then um you wouldn't say well not team leader but he and nakagami then have to sort of split the duties that mark was performing and then added to that alex had found out before the first race that he was going to leave the team at the end of the year because they'd already hired Paul Espargaro. Uh, so it was a, it's been a really bizarre time for him. He then goes on to take podiums. I mean, we should give him this credit. You know, he took two podiums as a rookie on the Honda. We know the Honda's a difficult bike. So, you know, he, he, he did a great rookie year, really, all things considered, uh, for, for someone on the Honda. Then he gets moved to LCR, and really it's, it's, it's just dropped away, hasn't it, the, the results. So really big year. I think, I think make or break is a fair description of, of, of the year coming up for him because – now he's going to be on this proven bike, this proven Ducati. And, uh, you know, we've seen what Bastianini's done on it this year. It'll, it'll still be a year old bike, but still we've seen the Ducati. It's a very capable package. Um, and, and I think going back to our previous conversations, you know, Alex does, it seems, bring some sponsorship with him from Estrella, the, the, the beer company. So that will help with Grassini. They don't have a title sponsor at the moment. That's not to say that Grassini, um, Estrella is a title sponsor, but it's going to help, I think, with some sponsorship. They're also in a bit of a difficult situation, Grassini, in that they signed a two year deal with Ducati. So obviously, this is year one. Next year is year two. So that, that kind of prevented them from signing you know, anything longer than a one year deal with their rider for next year. And it seems like that might have been a factor for Oliveira, you know, that he wanted a two year deal. And, and but, you know, they couldn't guarantee even what bikes they'll have for the, let's say, the, the second year of that. So Alex Marquez seems to have been willing to take, you know, to take the one year deal. And uh, yeah, a, a surprise, I think that he's basically was, I mean, among the first satellite riders now, one of the few at the moment to have a confirmed place. Well, he lives to fight for another year, at least. Um, you bring up Takanakagami. Tom has asked, Ayagura or Nakagami? <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to take that one first? So, so that, that, that's the second set of bus wheels I can feel over me. <laughs> Don't blame me. <laughs> Don't blame me. Blame Tom, who asked the question. I'm merely a mouthpiece. <laughs> Go on then, Pete. You can have that one. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you know what at this stage of the season I, it's, i'd almost toss a coin because i think uh, as they stand right now you can make an equal argument both ways i mean i thought i thought you know when when, when uh, agura won that race i thought right you know he's gonna he's gonna build that but you know continue that momentum get a get a couple more wins under his belt and then to be honest it would be pretty much a done deal for me that he was ready to move up but he hasn't, has he? I know he's still in title contention and he, he, you know, he's done a great job of recovering during the races, but he hasn't made it a slam dunk case that he should be on that bike for next year, in my opinion, for next year. Uh, for next year. He's definitely a future MotoGP rider, but at this stage, would you put it, you know, you've got Nakagami with all of his experience. We saw when uh, when Mark, um, you know, withdrew for the surgery, they took some of his parts. They didn't give them to Paul. They walked over to the LCR garage and gave them to Nakagami. And that, again, tells you that Honda value his, uh, you know, his feedback, his technical ability. You, you know, so again, do you do you replace someone with a rookie who who won't be able to, you know, they can't they can't push parts on him and say, right, I, I you know, sort this bike out. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Tom. It's uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm exactly fifty fifty at this stage of the season. I think if I was Honda, I wouldn't make a decision for a while. I would let a bit like Ducati have chosen to do with their factory seat. You know, they're going to wait until the end of August and just let Martin and Bastianini fight it out a bit longer and hopefully for their case they'll have a clear cut winner i think i'd do the same with the, with this uh, the lcr honda seat for me it's one of the most open apart from the tectoire seat one of the most difficult right now to put your finger on and say that's the guy who should be there i think yeah tough one really tough one what over to what you, a cop out come on Keith. <laughs> <laughs> i think it's i think it's time for a change i think that nakagami is at his opportunity and i think that ayogura um, he's next in line. It's time. Let's see what he can do. We've seen what's happened with 
you know, <laughs> I'm going to use the words fairly average Moto Two riders, Quattararo, um, uh, when he gets on a fight on a on a Moto GP bike. So, um, you know, I think it, if I was LCR, I'd be looking to try and inject a bit more enthusiasm into that team. And I think Nakagami's had a long time in that seat now, um, and he hasn't managed to come up with podium positions. So I think that uh, Ayogura will be a good bet to move across. Harsh, but the way I would do it. And interesting, just to add, that that would mean three new Honda riders out of four next year. You know, Mark would be the only one staying. You know, talk about a, a big change. So, yeah. But... Well, Honda need to do something, don't they, to... Uh, to kick starts or reinvigorate their team and performances don't they well uh still lots of uh, questions in i will uh, come to them next time so we'll leave them there for now i think we'll call that one a day i won't throw you under the bus anymore for uh, this podcast at least um my thanks to keith Hewitt, pete mclaren as always make sure uh, you're tuned in across crash.net for all the latest news and analysis as ever uh every day every week there's always stuff to find uh, and we'll be back with you next week get your questions in leave them in the comments section or tweet instagram or facebook us just so at Crash Moto GP. Uh, please do leave us a review as well wherever you get your podcasts, and we shall see you right back here next week. Bye bye.